Hello all of you beautiful people, Jules here for WhatCulture.com and I'm back with another episode of the awesomely titled and awfully hosted Choose Your Own Adventure, the weekly medieval themed format where I appear in glorious live action to deliver a list chosen by you. Yes you! Yes, you with the Megadeth t-shirt on, hello! And today we have to thank Darkfire Dreamer for this list on video game villains that were so good at being bad that we ended up wanting them to win. Now, just to be clear, in real life, we must all band together to make sure that true evil never prevails. But thanks to the rise of the sympathetic villain in video games and movies, it's actually getting worryingly easy to side with some of these big bads. So without further ado, let's get cracking, my little demons. As I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 video game villains we wanted to win. And don't forget that you can also submit your list ideas down below or to me here in the live chat where I'm probably just doing on something stupid unless you're watching this outside of the premiere in which there's nothing but other recommendations for videos. That one looks all right. That one, not so much though. Don't click on that one, unless it's a video with me in. Anyway, let's go on with the list. Number 10, Marlene, The Last of Us. One of the greatest things about The Last of Us is its prevailing sense of moral ambiguity. And come the end of the game, we're left completely upended with a situation that makes us ask whether Joel did the right thing. Now, after proclaiming, physician, heal thyself, and shooting his way through a hospital, we rescue Ellie from an operation that might have killed her, but also may have saved humanity. And the last person that's in your way is is Marlene, the leader of the Fireflies, who uses her pesky logic to make Joel look like an ass before he kills her. But the question is, how was she wrong? The life of one is surely worth the lives of the many, right? And true, there was admittedly no guarantee that Marlene's experiment would have netted a cure, but in this situation, in these dire times, surely they needed to try. This boils down to a tale of personal retribution versus the survival of our very race. And his murdering of Marlene in cold blood shows above all that some lives apparently are expendable, just not this particular child. It's a moral minefield, and one that's probably only going to get more explosive come the sequel, and I, for one, cannot wait. Number 9. Darth Treyer, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2 The Sith Lords Now, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2 basically teaches you to, um, well, never trust old people. Seeing late in the game, we get the reveal that Kreia is actually Darth Treyer. And while you might immediately be reaching for the director's cut in order to shoot her first, when you actually consider her motives, it's a lot less red and white than you might first imagine. Now, she explains to the player that she desires to annihilate the Force and end the relentless death and suffering that stems from the war between the Jedi and the Sith, and also to restore pure free will to the galaxy. Now, this is surely a good thing, right? I mean, I would certainly be happy with a few less lightning bolts being flung my way. And if you think about it, had Treya managed to succeed in her plan, she would have unquestionably saved a ton of lives. Now, she is not perfect, of course, as she kills a lot of people throughout the game. But it shows something that other Siths have not so far. That power is an illusion, and the only way to truly be free from it is to remove the values upon which it is measured. And that's pretty deep. Number eight, Solidus Snake, Metal Gear Solid 2, Sons of Liberty. Now, much like Darth Treyer, Metal Gear Solid 2, Solidus Snake strove to free humanity from some form of control, but ultimately went about it in a questionable and, yes, violent way. Now, his aim was to eliminate the shadowy world-controlling force known as the Patriots, all in the hope of giving personal freedoms back to citizens. Now, okay, that's, that's fine and dandy, but you probably shouldn't have used child soldiers or killed the protagonist's parents. Like, I'm not going to defend that in the slightest. The concept, love it, invited over for dinner. The child soldiers, no, that is a no from me. I'm turning my back if it was like a reality game show. I turn my back on you. No child soldiers. Am I clear on that point? <laughs> If only he'd gone about it through different means, we might be celebrating the Solidus rather than the Solid as the real hero of this Metal Gear franchise. Number seven, Handsome Jack Borderlands 2. 
Now, there's no denying that the Hyperion Corporation president, Handsome Jack, is a pure tyrant, ruling over the planet of Pandora with a spiky iron fist that shoots smaller iron fists, which then explode. And he does effectively enslave his daughter, which again, child soldiers and things like that, not good, don't want that. But his personality, god damn, how, how have they managed to make such an absolute prick so endlessly quotable? Even his plan of bringing law to the lawless is a good one. I mean, would you want to live on a planet where you are at risk of being eaten by the animals and or the populace by equal chance? Of course not. His means are too extreme, but his intentions of a society brought up to be productive and not predatory are ones that could be benevolent. And yet, despite it all, he's so beloved for being a bastard, so much so that how could you not want him to win? Oh yeah, the uh, murder. Keep forgetting about that. Number six, Ganondorf, the Legend of Zelda, the Wind Waker. The Legend of Zelda's evergreen antagonist, Ganondorf, is and always will be an asshole. However, the more that you know about this pig lad big bad, the more sympathetic he actually becomes. Now for ages, it was just thought that he was hell bent on conquering Hyrule just because he could to pass the time, but the Wind Waker sought to lend some much needed shade to this character. Through his periodic interactions with Link, he explains that his plan wasn't motivated by sheer maniacal self-interest, but actually to restore fertility to his desolate land. Hell, he even flatly explains that he doesn't want to kill Link or Zelda, and his poetic, sorrowful monologues in the game ultimately transform him into something more compellingly weary and tormented character. I mean, he's still a f***ing arsehole in the end because of what he does, but it's interesting to see how desperate he is to restore his kingdom to greatness. Number five, Saren, Mass Effect. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. That's the saying, isn't it? I mean, it's slightly different from us here up in the north. I mean, I live in Gateshead, so I'd actually say that the road to hell is paved badly because the f***ing council can't pull their f***ing finger out. But still, it basically describes Saren from Mass Effect, not the Gateshead part, the road to hell being paid with good intentions part. Because he's a member of the Spectres, an elite group which attempts to ensure stability throughout the galaxy, no matter the cost. And that leads him to encounter the Reaper flagship Sovereign. Now, after seeing the Reaper's plans to annihilate all organic life, he surmises that it would actually be better to serve and become indoctrinated rather than resist and everyone die in a futile battle against a superior foe. Now, as depressing as that sounds, He's right on a base level. I mean, the Reapers will come through and exterminate everything just as sure as Volus's hate high jump contests. And therefore, synthesis with the Reapers was actually a thoroughly understandable alternative. Plus, I mean, we'd get all those cool robot eyes like beep boop my motherboards, you know what I'm saying? I'm not, I lo listen, I'm not saying I want to join the Reapers. But I'm just saying if it was an option, I might consider it. Beep boop. Number four, the Colossi, Shadow of the Colossus. Okay, okay, so admittedly I am using the term villain rather loosely here, but at the outset of Shadow of the Colossus, it is made clear that these creatures need to go down harder than me after 10 Sambucas after the work Christmas party, if you are to ever get your long lost love back. Trust me, the drinking does not bring them back. Makes it worse. And yet, as the game carries on and players fell colossus after colossus, a creeping doubt begins to emerge that maybe these creatures are just minding their own damn business and all their stomps and swipes are basically them saying, f off mate and let me finish this bloody crossword in peace. So what you're left with is, Basically, you're the biggest monster of the land by the end of this story, and all you've actually done is given birth to an evil called Dormin, so <laughs> good going, mate. And so it's no wonder that the Colossi are on this list, because if things were just and fair in the world, they would have just crushed this little prick into paste like a fleshy tent peg and been on their way. Shaggy hair and all. Number three, Letho, the Witcher 2 Assassins of Kings. So, 
Letho is The Witcher 2's primary antagonist, and though he may look nothing more than just a muscle-bound version of yours truly, he's actually one of the smartest and most impressively Machiavellian characters in the entire Witcher universe, which is definitely like yours truly. It's ultimately revealed that Letho is in league with the Nif Nilf Nilfgaardian Ember, I can never say that, right? Who have offered to revive the dying Viper School of Witches if he helps to wipe out the rulers of the Northern Kingdoms. So, throughout the game, it is made clear that Letho is a fiercely intelligent villain who, regardless of whether you decide to kill or spare him at the end of the game, manages to effortlessly execute the bulk of his plan with a fair degree of ease. And he's also got a shared past with protagonist Big G, and so when it comes down to that final decision, most players simply couldn't bring themselves to actually kill him. As much as we can all argue that murder is flatly wrong no matter the cause, it is easy to see why Letho was so seduced so easily by the Empire. Number 2. Pagan Min – Far Cry 4 Though Far Cry 3's Vars is undeniably the most iconic antagonist in the franchise, Far Cry 4's Pagan Min actually has more depth than his predecessor. And by that, while I mean that he does murder his way from point A to point B with pointy weapons, the alternatives to his tyrannical rule, well, they're just as bad. The Sabal and the Golden Path both have horrible outcomes for helping them, highlighting that maybe an outsider should not be inserting themselves into another country's problems and slash or lives. Now, when you have these three horrors lined up in front of you, none of which will make the country better, does it even matter who you choose? In fact, the secret ending of Far Cry 4 is the only ending that actually shows a gesture without horror, with Min allowing you to scatter your mother's ashes and then offering to party hard with you. So, I mean, better the devil you know, right? Right? And number one, Shadow Lord, Nier. So, the big plot twist at the end of the first Nier is that the villainous Shadow Lord, more like Edge Lord, am I right, lads, is actually the gestalt version of Nier who is briefly playable at the very beginning of the game. And the Nier that players have actually been controlling for the majority is simply a replicant. Oh, what's that? Is that my brain leaking out of my ear? Doesn't matter. Let's just keep moving on. Now, the brilliant irony of this is that both versions of Nier effectively have have the same goal, and that's to save their daughter and also humanity as a whole, but they're coming at it from entirely different perspectives. Now, given that the replicant near slaughters his way through shades, even with the eventual knowledge that they were awkwardly just actually sentient people trying to fend off his attacks, he's not exactly the most sympathetic hero, all things considered. And so the game could have so easily just flipped the protagonist and antagonist around, given how difficult it actually is to passionately root against Shadow Lord with this knowledge. It's a game where you're both the good guy and the bad guy. So, of course, we want to win, so we win by... by winning. My brain... My brain! And there we go, my little demons. That was this week's Choose Your Own Adventure, and I hope that you enjoyed it from start to finish. And if you want to let me know down below what list you'd like to see on next week's episode, then do so, and I will pick one of the best. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. Now, today we detailed about villains who we wanted to win, and how with a shift in perspective, even our greatest problems could reveal things about them that make them easier to understand. Now, we can end up doing this to ourselves mentally, putting up roadblocks that stop us from achieving and even hurting others along the way without even realizing it. So why not give yourself that chance to be a little bit more understanding and take a step back and look at your situations objectively because you might find that whatever it was that was just getting in your way, it can probably be overcome with a fresh perspective. And of course, help from friends, family, and professionals in the support industry. So take a break, be kind to yourself, and always remember that you are bloody awesome. And if you want to do so, you can chat to me more about anything, video games, films, TV, wrestling, comics, Jesus, I get around over on Retro J with a zero. But until then, I will see you next Tuesday. Swear. Goodbye, my little demons. Sleep well. Don't let the bed bugs bite. 
I'm probably realizing now that Ozzy's gonna keep this in because he's an editor. So I'm probably just gonna eat you. Bye. Yum, yum, yum.